All right, I should be back now. Uh, can anybody see me? Can anybody hear me? Uh, whatever, and go ahead and put that in the chat if you do. How's it going, Lulu? All right. Can you see me? Is everything working fine? Can you guys hear me? Hi, Angel. Can you hear me, Angel? I, I don't want to start talking and then find out you guys can't hear me at all. All right, great. Then I'm going to get started. This little, I'm going to have a chat window up on the side. Uh, hopefully you guys can see kind of what I'm doing here. Um, real quick, I'm going to... Uh, we're just going to do... Going into some of this Gibbs sampling. Yeah, my computer gives me a lot of grief. If I crash, I'm going to try to come back on as soon as possible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this should be recorded for uh, up to 14 days. I have it all set up through Twitch. They sh if you guys come back and uh, if you guys come back to the Twitch channel, you should see previously recorded sessions or if you click on me specifically. Um, like I said, they should be up for 14 days. Okay, so uh, in the future, uh, I should be able to fix some of the bitrate issues that are going on that is causing uh, some of these uh, buffering issues that you guys are experiencing because I'm pushing it such a higher level than a lot of internet can handle, at least on my end as far as Wi-Fi is concerned. Uh, but if you can hear me loud and clear, I'm just going to go straight into the... Uh, portion where I'm going to start talking about some of these Gibbs sampling issues, uh, unless you guys have any specific questions. If you do, please let me know. I'll keep an eye on chat and uh, pause in and among there and figure out what's going on. But if not, I'm going to move into office hours. So the first thing we want to do when we're in office hours is we want to uh, ensure that we have our environment set up. So if you already see it, I already have my Conda ENV uh, activated to our B529, and that's fine. Uh, and then I already started Jupiter Lab, so I'm going to bring us over to Jupiter Lab. And here is just the workspace. I just opened up a blank uh, IPython notebook, and I'm going to turn this into uh, Office. Hours, well, what should I call it? Is it the first? Yeah, one, two, one, 
nine, whatever. I'm going to put all this stuff on a GitHub repo and, uh, and I'll put out an announcement for you guys, uh, if for the class of where I put this repo for us. So if you guys are interested, or if you're going to want to share some of the stuff we've worked through, then we'll put it in, uh, you'll be able to get it there. So, uh, just for the sake of thoroughness to Okay, so when we're looking at the problem at hand as far as the, the Gibbs sampling is concerned, uh, we have to, again, always ask ourselves, what do we have and what do we need? Uh, I always ask this to myself whenever I'm doing things, so I'm going to just kind of go through one at a time. So let's start with... Uh, let's get our imports in so we don't have to worry about this. And a lot of this is stuff we're going to be copying and pasting from the original notebook that Alan had set up. But I'm just going to, for the sake of thoroughness, type it in here. So he has import sys so that we can add this, uh, this path to our, uh, our path temporarily add. And that's a fun thing to know about when it comes to Python is when you use this uh, sys.path.insert or sys.path.append, it just does a temporary, temporary insertion into your path. And this just allows us to figure out where, um, where Python's going to look for the stuff that we're trying to import. Now, uh, Alan really relies on using NumPy, and NumPy is great, but there's actually a lower level that we can go as far as uh, you implementing a lot of the randomness that we're trying to instill in our Gibbs sampling. And the first place we should go to whenever we're doing any random is the random uh, package. So just import random. And then we want to bring in our uh, the other packages we're going to be needing. So import uh, numpy as np, import pandas as d. I'm going to import a couple extra stuff. Import seek logo as sl. Now, if you guys didn't have, or if you guys had the issue before with seek logo having some issues, um, I pushed a recent update today. So if you do a conda install c bioconda, and this is just saying install from the bioconda channel, uh, seek logo equals 5.29.1 web logo and uh, go This should overcome a lot of issues that many of you guys were having with Seek Logo if you were having. Are you guys still having some buffering issues right now? Okay, uh, I'm just going to check in on you guys. This is the first time I've done a live stream of any sort. So uh, I'm just going to touch base with you guys every once in a while just to make sure everything's going okay. So uh, right now, all I'm doing is installing my uh, brand new Seek logo, fixes some issues, um, ensuring web logos installed, and specifically Ghost Script. Ghost Script was a problem that wasn't added as one of the dependencies in Seek Logo. So when people were trying to run some of this Ghost Script stuff, or when they're trying to run some of the Seek Logo stuff, it was having these uh, errors saying a GS script not found or something along. So all I'm doing is installing those. And once those are up, I'm going to actually leverage Seek Logo, not just for the plotting of the motif, but actually to handle some of the uh, computing information uh, 
uh, the IC scores, information content, uh, that is used when we're detect trying to detect uh, convergence. And we'll talk about convergence in a little bit, about why it can be a uh, problem. Okay, so now that everything's installed, I'm going to move over to my Jupyter Lab, and I'm going to bring in my Seek logo SSL, um, and then bring in the other stuff that we're going to be using from the class. So simple ones like data readers, import, star. We want to bring in all the data readers. For those of you that may not know this lingo, just being as, uh, as explicit as possible, this idea is we added the shared folder to our path. So the shared folder has data readers, has uh, the seek ops and all those other .pys. So with that being added, we're able to import those scripts into our program right now. And data readers has the our get fast a and get G, uh, gff. So when we say import star, instead of having to type data readers dot import or data readers dot get fast a or data readers dot uh, get gff, we can just say uh, when we say from data readers import star, we can just call it directly. So we don't have to do the data readers dot anymore. We can just say uh, use get fast a or whatever it is. Now let's keep on going. So uh, we're going to need some of the seek ops. So uh, from seek ops uh, import get seek. And I'm going to go a step further than from what Alan had. And I'm going to put reverse uh, complement here as well, just so that we have both of those things that come out of the seek ops. Now, in my own uh implementation of this i added some extra stuff to make things a little bit more apparent a little uh, a little bit easier and computationally more sound and to do that we're going to be bringing in these additional libraries that are kind of specialty libraries but i'll introduce them now so from collections collections is a library that is part or a package part of the standard li python library and it contains some really highly performant uh, data structures that help along the way doing specific tasks. And the ones we're going to be using today, one is called counter and one is called deck. Um, actually, we don't even need deck. My new implementation doesn't even require but counter. What's special about counter is that uh, it's a special sort of dictionary in that when you add things to the dictionary, it actually counts the number, it keeps a track of the counts that it sees of that specific object. So while it looks kind of like a set in that you're only giving it keys, it's actually storing everything you're adding to it as keys, and then the values are automatically being appended or uh, incremented. So as it sees things, it'll uh, add stuff, it'll add to this dictionary so we can keep track of things. And what's great about this is it's super, super performant. It's built from the ground up. Um, the last one we're going to be using, this is more for uh, dynamic use, uh, making things a little bit easier in the long run, uh, especially if you want to expand this uh, motif finder, this Gibbs motif finder to other, uh, other alphabets other than DNA. Uh, if we want to start talking about uh, amino acids and such. So we're going to say from funk tools. Now funk tools is a package that's already in the Python standard library that contains specific functions that are particularly helpful to make your functions work better. And the one we're going to be using is called the LRU cache. And what LRU cache stands for is the least recently used. Least recently used means that it keeps track of like oh, this item hasn't been used and we've already done these other things up till now, so it gets rid of it out of memory. And that way we can, if we come up to a computation that is uh, calculated over and over and over and over and over again, because we store it in cache, we don't have to compute it every single time. We only have to compute it once. And if it's seen within a certain amount of times, it doesn't have to compute again. It'll just give us back the last result it gave. So this can actually make it uh, make certain functions super helpful if you plan on reusing them over and over and over again. All right, so that's going to be it as far as our imports are concerned. 
Uh, are there any questions right now? Are you still with us, Angel? Or is it just you, Lulu, and there's somebody else? There's two of you. Now, if we get to the end of the office hours and you guys uh, really like this kind of uh, approach to doing this digitally, uh, go ahead and go to the bottom of the Twitch page and click uh, follow. And it should give you... Um, sorry, what was the note? There's a little bit of delay from what, what that was. Just uh, whatever. But if you guys like this avenue, or if I can clean up the uh, the encoding a little bit better, maybe this will go smoother in the future. And you can click follow on Twitch, and that way you might get notifications that uh, an office hours has started up, whatever. Okay, no question. So. Uh, the very first thing we're going to do is because we're dealing with a lot of this, uh, the idea of PFMs versus uh, PWMs and trying to keep track of rows and columns, the original way that Seek Logo does handle this is that each column, each column, if we look at this, each column of a data frame is some letter some base and this can be a c g t and then down here is the position so zero one two three four so on blah 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 okay so this is this is great in that uh at the end user level of things it actually is super helpful in trying to uh understand the data that you're dealing with at that time, like a data exploration, it makes it digestible to the end user. The issue, however, is that uh, it doesn't make it very performant when we trying when we start when we start trying to uh, deal with uh, pandas and indexing. Indexing in pandas is actually, while it's helpful, and uh, unless you're dealing with a particularly big uh, or for sufficiently large data frame that is going to be a, essentially static for a long period of time, there's a significant overhead, a significant memory overhead for creating that data frame over and over and over and over and over and over again. And uh, Pandas wasn't built for, like it can do specific indexing, but it's not built for programmatic indexing access. So things like NumPy, which is a lower level uh, the pandas is super helpful in this. This is what they're built for, was that kind of thing. Now, one of the problems that we deal with this is that uh, the alphabets that we deal with when it comes to DNA and these motifs that we're dealing with in class are those columns can be considered of A, C, G, and T, but we can't reference them as A, C, G, and T because of the slow lookup times in Jupiter or in uh, pandas. So we're going to create a quick little function that's just used, we're, we're just going to say it's used for converting uh, bases to index positions, or, specific, or we'll say columns. Now the idea of this is whenever we see a specific base, like an A or a T or whatever, we want to convert that or translate that into uh, into a number. So if it's A, we want it to be zero because it's column zero. It's C, it's going to be one because it's column one. So this is the only place that we're going to be doing this LRU cache. And the helpful thing about this LRU cache is I'm setting it to 20. The, the helpful thing here is that LRU cache, remember what I said, is every time that it sees this same uh, function, 
the same signature, the same call or invocation, it just spits out what it's already calculated for if, there, if it's within the last 20 or so calls. So uh, the reason I set it to 20, because if you think about it, if we think about just with regard to our class, the only alphabet we really have to deal with are A, C, G, and T. So there's only four that we actually really have to worry about. But here I want to have you open your mind and think, if we expand this a little further to the protein world and we start dealing with amino acid, if we set this to 20 right now, it'll be happy to handle all of those amino acids. So I'm going to write some uh, Seek logo backend gobbledygook. Uh, the idea behind this is we're leveraging some of the code that's already been written into Seek logo to uh, help handle these base conversions. Now, after I write this function, I'm actually going to write a simpler way of doing this just with respect to DNA. Um, but if you follow along this way, this is just as performant, if not better. So uh, the idea, well, I'm going to call this uh, base to index. And all it's going to need is this letter. What base are we looking at? But I'm going to add some additional arguments here, and I'm going to set default arguments to them so that uh, if we call it with any other alphabet type, uh, like amino acid or uh, ambiguous DNA or whatever, uh, it'll be able to handle that. So uh, these are just, again, these are just some uh, backend API things that a Seek logo does generally by itself. Now, here's we're going to be playing around with some of the Seek logo stuff. I'm going to say if alphabet is not is none. If alpha if alphabet type in Seek logo.utils. Now these are special utilities that I wrote into Seek logo. IDX letters. Now, all this is is a dictionary of all the different index or all the different alphabets that uh, Seek Logo supports. These are like, uh, actually, these are like DNA, reduced DNA, ambiguous RNA, reduced RNA, ambiguous RNA. These are things like gaps and uh, nucleotides can, that can be either cytosine or, or uh, thymine. So, this is just a dictionary that contains all those. And now we're just going to say alphabet equals sl dot utils dot. And now I'm just looking it up. I'm just, I'm just going to look up that alphabet type so that I, could, I don't have to type what my alphabet is every single time. It'll automatically figure it out if, it, if it's all default. Otherwise, now this is the case in which somebody gives a, a custom alphabet. I'm just going to say alphabet equals alphabet. Now, this is just saying that this alphabet that the user gave is now overriding what this function is using for alphabet. And this allows people to use their own custom alphabets should they choose. Now, all we're doing here is I'm just going to return and we're going to play around with a, a generator expression, but we're wrapping it with those braces, the curly braces. And this is to make a dictionary in place. And the idea here is uh, we already know what this alphabet is. The alphabet's already in order, A, C, G, T, specifically when in DNA. So I'm going to say for I base and enumerate. And now I'm going to say alphabet, the alphabet that we just looked up in that dictionary. So what this does is this enumerate gives us the base position and the base. It just goes through the item. It just iterates through the item one at a time. So now to create our dictionary, all I'm going to say is base is the key and the uh, value is I. And now all we want to return is the letter of interest. So now every time this function's called uh, with a specific letter like A, C, G, T, it'll spit out 0, 1, 2, 3. And now this allows us to easily convert a base to a number. Now a uh, more straightforward way of doing this is just creating a dictionary. So just say uh, base convert, 
equals, and we could just do that plain out. A zero C one G two and T it's three. Now the way that this works is it's essentially the same thing. It's just a dictionary. And if I wanted to convert something, I could just say base conf, and then I want to look up a specific letter in a sequence like A, and it'll spit out zero, because that's the index that I've determined it to be. So this is one way, way to do it. I'm not going to do that for today. I'm just going to be dealing with this LRU cache just because I keep, keep trying to think a little further. All right, the next part we're going to be dealing with is uh, one of the biggest issues and one of the uh, biggest uh, bottlenecks in computing for uh, Gibbs sample. And that is building the PFM, uh, the PFM from the sequences or the PFM from the motifs. And there's these like, two different ways of looking at the same exact thing. So um, the idea here is that if we are dealing with a bunch of sequences, if I just say ACGT, blah, 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 and we have all these. Uh, all these sequences in this file, just like this, right? We This is just a small, weird toy example. The idea of Gibbs sampling, or of building this PFM, is it says, at this first position, count all the letters in this column. At the second position, count all the letters in the column. And so on and so forth. And then once you've done that, then you just divide by the total, and now you've created frequencies. So if we look at this column, the count of A is 3 in this column, and it's 3 over 3, so its probability of it being A is going to be 1. And if we look at more uh, less conserved areas, uh, like this one, there'd be 1 over 3 for C, 1 over 3 for A, and 1 over 3 for G. So that's the idea of building up uh, this PFM from a sequence. So in looking at this, we want to, I'm just going to be re, we already have this under the CCOPS um, module that's already been given to you, but I'm cleaning mine up just a little bit more, uh, just to make it a little bit more performant and a little bit more direct. And now all build PFM is going to need is the sequences. And then I'm going to, again, use some stuff that I've, just some of the Seek Ops or the Seek logo back end stuff. And you're going to see this over and over again. And the reason I do this is uh, not because this particular function may need the alphabet type in the alphabet, but because another function downstream may need those. So that I'm allowing my function to be able to cha be changed at any point of the workflow. Uh, so, nonetheless. Okay, so first we're going to figure out is what's the alphabet the person's going to be using. And we're going to see the same stuff that we already saw up here. Uh, so I'm just going to copy this. It's fine. Now I'm just going to change a couple of things here. Instead of alphabet, I'm just going to call it fresh alphabet. And the same. And the reason here is I don't want to potentially override something the user is implied later on. But this is just a uh, copy paste. We're just trying to make sure that we know what our columns are going to be in our ranks. Okay, so first we need to initialize the empty array. Now, we've already seen this in the uh, seek ops, and you guys have already seen this if you looked at that function at all. And the idea is we're just going to create a blank PFM filled with zeros. So the idea with uh, numpy dot zeros is it'll create an array of a certain size and then automatically fill everything inside that array with zero. Now, in this first part of the invocation of zeros, we got we have to uh, tell it what the size of the array is going to be. So I'm just going to say it's the length of the uh, sequences and just the first item because all the sequences should technically be about the same size. Uh, that's not always correct. In this example, the stuff that we've been dealing with, those FASTA files, each sequence FASTA file, 
uh, each sequence is 50 base pairs long or more. Anyways, uh, but here we're just saying the first uh, size of this array is going to be the length of the sequence. So these are going to be the number of rows. The second number is the length of fresh alphabet. Now this is saying if it's A, C, G, and T, it's going to put us with four columns with n number of rows. And uh, because this is going to be a PFM, PFMs are just counts. So I'm just going to set a D type to uh, np.int64. No big deal. All this is saying is what it's going to initialize everything to zeros and say that any value that's going to be in this array has to be integer. It's not going to try to convert it into something else later on down. Okay, so uh, add basewise counts to the NumPy array to build the PFM. So the idea here is now we need to iterate through those fast A sequences. Thinking of the big picture. Whoops. If we're thinking of the big picture, the point of build PFM is to go through our fast A and, or our fast A list and develop this PFM for it. So the idea, or I need to stop saying the idea, uh, for seek in sequences, we just need to go through each of those uh, sequences one at a time. And I'm going to do the enumerate again because enumerate's really helpful in this instead of range, length, in. Uh, whatever way other people have done it. Because this again gives us both the base and that position. So it's like counting and giving us the value at the same time. And the reason we need this uh, base and position is because that's how we're going to uh, we're going to address the array. Because remember, the position is the row and the base is the column. So now we're going to modify that PFM by saying PFM pause. So now we're saying which row we're in. And here's where we're going to be playing around with this base to index. Now I'm just going to say base to index. Now, I don't really care about what my alphabet type is right now because it's all still DNA, but it's no, I, it's easy for me just to add these other parts here uh, just for the sake of uh, thoroughness. Now we're saying at this row and at this column, I see this letter, so I just want to increment. it. That's all PFM is, right? We're just counting what's happening at those positions. And now I just want to return PFM, because after it's gone through all those sequences, it should have picked up or should have created this PFM. Okay, so the uh, second part to this, if you look at the Seek ops or motif ops, another, another function that we have to define is the build PWM. Now, if you, this is one of the parts where if you were to go through Seek logo and have Seek logo compute the PWM for you every time, it is actually significantly slower uh, than just doing it uh, natively through NumPy. So you can go that route, and it does work, and I have many implementations that do it. But we're going to do it a little bit uh, more lower level so that we can, if we're dealing with 10,000 so on epics or iterations, we want this to go as quickly as possible. So let's look at building this PFM. Now, or not, PWM. Now, this is significantly different than the one you may have seen uh, in the Motif Ops script. And that's because there's a lot of. Uh, code that I don't particularly agree with. Not that it's bad. I just uh, feels a little unreadable in places or counterintuitive. So I did this to, uh, I wrote it this way to allow for a certain degree of readability and interpretive. Now these two keyword arguments that I've created, pseudo count and background, up till now it's always been assumed that these are just going to be 0.25. If you look at the motif ops, exactly what it says, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. And that's because we're only dealing with four bases. Now, pseudo count, the idea of pseudo count is we have to offset. When we take a PFM, convert it to a, a PPM, we and then we take a PPM and turn it into a PWM, we have to convert that uh, that PPM to a PWM. We, we convert it using a, a log2 transform. Now, 
if there's a base, like if we look in, if there's a base at that specific position that has a zero probability, the NP log two of that is negative infinity. So pseudo counts, the only purpose of pseudo count is just offsetting that just by a little bit so that it doesn't become a negative infinity because negative infinities can be kind of hairy to deal with. Um, now background, background is just saying what's the background frequency of the, of the specific base. So here we're saying all the bases have a 0.5 uh, possi uh, background possibility of occurring. Now that's not particularly biologically true, and there are ways to compute it. And if you look at the PowerPoint presentation that Ryan did, he actually talks about if you do this Gibbs sampling, you can compute the background as you see fit uh, based off of using the unused uh, bases. Uh, or if you're dealing with a, an organism that, uh, an organism or a specific spot in uh, an organism's genome that is specifically uh, GC rich or so on and so forth, you can actually change these backgrounds. Here. But for the naivete of the class, we're just treating it as everything is equally possible. And that's fine. It's, a, it's an okay assumption for teaching purposes. So again, we need to initialize. Are there any questions while I'm typing some of this stuff? on. You'll hear me. Okay. I'm not seeing anything in chat. I'm just going to keep going forward. The idea here is that with this PWM, again, we're doing the same kind of thing we did with the PFM. We just have to initialize our PFM. But I'm kind of cheating here because I know what I'm getting to, PF, uh, to create this PWM. I'm getting this position frequency matrix. And that's supposed to be a NumPy array. Well, NumPy array has this dot shape. So to look at this, if we see this in real time, I'm going to say a equals np array, uh, or maybe np dot random dot normal. I don't know. So if we look at a, it actually has a shape, and it'll say, oh, it's going to pull out these two values. So it's just saying there's two values out. So every array has a shape. That shape is always rows and columns. So we're just shortcutting this and saying PFM and just take the shape of that and just recreate a PWM array using the same measurements, which is a, a really great shortcut in making sure that each array is the same thing and we don't have to recalculate it every single time. Um, now we start playing around with that PFM. The first one is to calculate the sums of each row or each column. See. And a way easy way to do this, and we're going to be leveraging a lot of NumPy. NumPy has this np.sum. And what this sum does is it'll say it's an aggregate function, so it allows us to either sum uh, row wise, column wise, or total. So it'll do row and column. Uh, so we can define which way it's going to be. And we're going to say we're going to want to sum this PFM. And now we're going to tell it specifically axis equals one. So this tells us that it's going to be dealing in a uh, row row wise fashion. And then I just want to reshape this one because what this does when it sums it is it'll sum across. It's a two D array. It'll sum across and then it creates this. In this case, because of where we're going to be dealing with this PFM PWM stuff, we're going to be dealing with. Uh, 10, a 10 length sequence. It's just going to convert that into a 10 by 0 uh, vector. And I'm just reshaping it to make sure that I ensure that it's in uh, two dimensional space, but it's still only 
column. Just a weird little wonky uh, numpy to deal with when computing that. Now, let's set our uh, probabilities. Now, if you look at the motif or the build PWM in the motif ops, uh, you could see that this is exactly where uh, this is exactly where Alan just set these to 0.5 for simplicity's sake. And here I'm saying I'm allowing it to be whatever I want it. So whatever I set it. Now, um, in this next portion, this is where the math gets kind of got uh, uh, kind of hinky. If you look at the original version of this, let's see if I can bring that up. Okay, so if we look at this this one, you can see, yeah, here's where he set that 0.5, perfectly fine for education purposes. But here he goes four range and four or four i in range four. He's saying go through each base and four i in range length length pwm zero. Uh, so here he's saying what's the length, what what's the sequence of this pwm, and we need to iterate each of those. And then they, he goes through and individually uh, looks at those arrays or at those spe uh, specific cells and calculates this log two and then converts, adds the pseudo count, sums, and then multiplies by four. And then uh, final n takes into account background. This works perfectly fine. This is, uh, there's, there's no problem with this and it works. However, it's not the most performant way of tackling the same problem, and we can actually overcome this in allowing us to do what NumPy calls broadcasting or vectorization. So since we're going to be doing the same thing to each of these positions, uh, we can actually just let, uh, we can just let uh, NumPy do it for us. So here I'm just going to say pwm equals mp.log2. This looks better already. And we want to take that uh, numerator is the PFM plus P. So what this is saying is each item in the PFM, we want to add this 0.5, whatever we had for our pseudo. And it'll do that element wise, because since P is a, uh, a constant scalar, it'll just scale everything in that array by the same value element. -wise. And after I have that, I need to divide and I'm going to take that sums the sums that we did up here. I'm going to take those, those sums, I'm going to add that uh, P, the pseudo count to it, times by the PFM dot shape and one. Now, my PFM is bases are on the top, uh, positions are on the rows, or bases are on the columns and positions are on the rows. Uh, so my shape's a little different because it's transposed, but it's the same problem. And the same thing, np.log2 uh, background. Okay, so what this does in the end is it essentially fulfills the same exact thing that he was trying to do in the other one, but it does it all in one command instead of having to iterate through it. Because the general rule of thought, rule of thumb when it comes to NumPy, is that you never want to, or I should say you never, it's if you are iterating through columns and rows on an array, it's almost always better to just broadcast across the whole array all at once. So that's all I did was I converted that into this. So if you look at this, we've actually just computed this and we didn't identify each column and row independent of each other. We've created this PWM from scratch. That means if we look back in retrospect, we don't even need this line anymore. We don't need to initialize because we create it. And once we're done with this, return that PWM. Now, I promise you that this is a terrifically performant program considering what we're doing in just pure Python. Okay. There are three of you here. Are, are you guys okay? Do you have any questions? Do you want me to move on? If you want me to move on, just say move on in chat.
Okay, moving on. How you doing, Lulu? Handling this okay? All right, cool. All right, now I'm going to take a step back. These are some big, heavy parts that we've already covered in the other classes. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of clean up the code a little bit. Now let's bring it back to the Gibbs sampling that we were dealing with. The very first part of Gibbs sampling is we need to get the motifs. We need to get the sequences that we're dealing with. And this highlights back to class four in that uh, we need to pull out stuff that are the promoter sequences. And we could just copy and paste things, but I'm actually going to create a function that does this because it seems like it's going to be something we're going to do many times. So I'm just going to call this def get promoters. And I'm going to say we need a fast A file. We need a GFF file. Uh, what is the size of the promoter sequence that we want to pull out? And what is the pattern? And this was specific the the uh, Shine Delgarno, which is AGG AGG. Now, what this allows is somebody looking for any specific pattern instead of just the Shine Delgarno. But because it's set up here as a default argument, uh, if somebody wants to do it, they can. If somebody doesn't want to change it and just stick with Shine Delgarno, that's perfectly fine too. You don't have to type it in. So these look a lot alike of what you've already done in class. So for name, seek in get fast a and now instead of putting the actual fast a name in there i'm going to say uh the fast a file and now we got to go through the gffs for gff entry in uh get gff and then we do our GFF file so here we're saying through each FASTA file, now through each GFF entry, we want to check every single one of those uh, GFF entries to find out if that specific GFF entry is in the FASTA file. And if it's a coding sequence, pull out that information. Uh, so promoter sequence equals get seek uh, sequence gff entry dot start and again this is what you guys have already done in class i'm just doing this for reiteration sake dot end gff entry dot and gff so now that we have that promoter sequence we need to see if this promoter sequence uh, contains the sequence, uh, the pattern we're interested. So if pattern in uh, promoter seek, now we're saying is the Shine Delgarno sequence within the promoter sequence that we pulled out? If it is, seeks dot append uh, promoter. So now we're saying if this has the Shine Delgarno sequence in it, I want to add it to my. Uh, list over here, and then once I'm done, I'm going to say else. And the idea here is this is a for loop, and this is going to iterate through each of them. Upon successful iteration, that's what this else does. If there's an else at the end of a for loop, means if this for loop has finished without error, do this, and we want to say return seeks. Now, this you can do this this way, that's perfectly fine, but if you want to change it and just do it what you've always done in class and just do this, this is perfectly fine too. I just always like that graceful exit concept, but that's just me. All right, so I'm going to pull open this other one where they already had the sequence, and I just want to take those copy and paste. Because I don't So now I've already defined where our files are. And if I do this git promoters, uh, I can say so seeks equals get promoters and give it seek file and the GFF file. And I'm just going to keep everything else the same. Perfect. 
fine. It'll do this and you see that it thought. And now since it's a function, I can do this however many times I want. It's not hard coded to be these specific files. I can put whatever file I want in there whenever I want. So here we see that we have all of those promoter sequences. And, and since I made sure that the size of my promoter sequence will always be 50, I can always ensure that everything in the sequence seeks are going to be uh, 50 length. Okay, so now that I have this, now we get into the, the big meat. I already started, I now have my sequences. Um, let's go through this and start creating our Gibbs code default. So def Gibbs finder. Now this is just a little different naming uh, convention than what we used in the solutions. Uh, just highlighting this so that you don't freak out. It's not completely uh, drop-in replacement. You would have to actually change the name. But if you look at this example of what he has in the solutions, all he all he requires is the sequences and the size of the kmers that are of interest. Now I'm going to go a big step forward in this, a huge step forward in this. And I'm going to add a bunch more functionality that I don't feel that I feel allows for a, a better understanding of the space that we're working. So first, we're going to still need those sequences because that's what it's going to do. And then k, and we can have k equal to whatever. I'm going to set the k, k to a default of 10. And then if you look at this example of his Gibbs motif finder, he says uh, for i and Okay, I think this is the one that I changed. This should have been 10,000. And what he was saying is, is uh, going through this each time uh, for 10,000 times, uh, try to find this convergence. Uh, so what that's called in computing terms, or specifically in machine learning, which this is kind of an offshoot of that, more dynamic programming, uh, it's called an epic. So I'm just going to say epics equals 10,000. And now this allows the user to set how many iterations this is going to go. Because if you set this to 10,000 and your code is, or if you hard code it to 10,000 and you write your code, uh, and there's some bug in it, you won't know until the very end. And then I'm going to create a tolerance. And we'll, we'll talk about this tolerance in a little bit. I'm just putting up the signature right now of what our program of our function background and here's some more uh seek logo stuff this is if the user wants to define their own background uh compute background because there is a way that throughout the implementation here that we can actually compute the background given the information that we've already given and uh pseudo counts in case the user wants to uh, overwrite pseudo count, and we're just going to set this to 0 0.5. And then the final bit of seek logo, uh, carry on, and that we're going to create alphabet type A, alphabet equals. Now, again, this is just part of the function signature in case the user wants to use a different type of alphabet. Okay, so now our signature is done. You guys may not understand everything that's right here. I'll, I promise you that I'll explain each step along the way. Um, the first part is we need to figure out uh, what the initial uh, Gibbs setup is. Because if we look back at the solutions, he does this first part where he says for i in range, in range n, and then goes through all of the sequences and creates a, a random Gibbs uh, or random motif matrix already. 
So the idea of the Gibbs is saying, go through uh, each of the sequences, and if we look at here, he's saying is, at some random interval or random position, or uh, random index, such that that index is less than whatever our K length is, pull out that sequence or pull out that portion of that sequence and add it to the motifs. And then randomly select whether or not it's going to be a positive strand or negative strand, and then compute it as such. And the idea of this randomness is that we should find, we should get to a probabilistically most likely uh, motif uh, that contains this uh, pattern should be able to identify instead of just finding the best we probabilistic remove some bias bubble stats um so there's this initial creating the gibbs so uh in my implementation i'm going to just off creation the initial initialization that sounds like a function it's just something that i want to off i want to hand off to something else because i don't want too many for loops all inside the same function so here I'm just going to say motifs and uh, init background. And we'll talk about this init in a second. Init gibbs sequences. Okay, so here we're going to take a quick second and I'm going to create another function up here called init gibbs. Now, init gibbs is actually a super simple function. It essentially does the same thing that his does. Uh, we're just doing it in a little classier way. So, and this is actually really fun Python stuff. You get into doing randomness. Uh, so pay attention if you're interested in this stuff. So we're going to init this Gibbs and take sequences and K equal 10 setting. Um, so the first part is just what he did. Motifs equals an empty list n equals counts equals none, just uh, initializing some values for seek in sequence. So now this is the first time we're actually going to be touching those fast A sequence. Um, now we take the first sequence, and I'm always wanting to control for those soft masking that may be in fast A file. So C equals C upper. You guys saw this from 575 a lot. Uh, you didn't so, so, so much see it in this class. We just happen to be dealing with files that don't have these. But again, I'm always thinking about what's the next step. I try to use this in a way. This is what I do. Um, so now we're going to start playing around with the randomness. Let's start our random. So here I'm going to say idx equals random.randint. And what's great about uh, random.randint is it's the same concept as numpy, but I don't have to deal with the entire framework of numpy. I could just deal with just the Python standard library. So here I'm saying any number from zero to length of the sequence uh, minus k plus one. Now, the idea of this minus k plus one is that Python intervals are half open, half closed. The, the idea here is if I say uh, print list range 10. If we look at this, it'll go from zero all the way to nine. It goes to up to and including, or up to but not including whatever value we put in. here. So because we want to ensure that if we're pulling out something, so say we have some sequence, A equals, I don't know, AC, ACGT, ACG, whatever. If I wanted to pull a random uh, index position out of this. Let's play around with this. Random dot rand int, and then I said a, or I said zero to length a. Um, if I just did this over and over again, uh, let's say whatever minus k, minus three, whatever if our, our k is three, and I do this over and over again, you'll see that if I keep running this over. We actually never get the number seven. And seven, if it landed on seven, it would allow us to pull the entire GTA, the very tail end. It would allow us to pull the uh, entire portion. But if you leave off the, if you 
don't add this plus one to it. Uh, when we do this plus one, sooner or later, it'll allow us to get that seven. So it it pushes our interval just to the to the right so that it is uh, inclusive, completely inclusive. So here we take this uh, plus one, and now we get our first subsequence. Seek, and I want everything up to the, I want the index uh, to the index plus K. So this is saying I want uh, wherever that random position was plus the entire camera that we're looking at. And now we, now we start taking that background seek. And this is the idea of the init background. I can say I want to take all the other stuff that's in the seek. So everything before that index, everything before that index position, and I want to add this to everything uh, after the index position. So here we'll take everything that isn't in that kmer, put them together, and now this allows us to count background frequencies from the given values that we're looking at. Now those background frequencies allow us to say oh, this is a GC-rich organism, or this is a, uh, or so on and so forth, really high GC content. Um, this allows us to compute it dynamically on the fly. So here we're going to do a little bit of fun for checking for the positive strand. So if not random choice, and I'm saying out of the numbers 0 and 1, pick something random. Well, if not random, so that means if random.choice selects zero, that evaluates to false. So if this is false, we're on the positive strand. Uh, Motifs.end sub C. So I want to add that subsequence and add it. Now there's going to be this nether line here. I'm just going to do this uh, blank now. Uh, we'll get to this in a second. Now we deal with the uh, negative strand. So if it didn't, if it selected one, this doesn't evaluate to true. So then uh, it goes on. Now we deal with the negative strand. So motifs dot append, and now we do the reverse complement of sub seek. So if this is all making sense, now we're going to play around with that background. So the background, the idea of the background will. I'll move up to this next uh, the function for computing the background in a second, um, but it's the idea of keeping online stats, keeping an idea of uh, continually uh, evolving data frame without having to store all the data at once. So we're going to keep track of these n and count as we that's what we created up here. n and counts equals get background, and this will be a function that I'm going to write just a second, and we're going to give it that background seek, that sequence, the number of n, and the number of n. And the same thing I'm going to apply down here, but instead of bg seek, I'm going to do reverse complement of. Okay, so here, just to clarify this uh, get background, I'm going to move up just to write that uh, real quick. Get background, really simple um, function. The idea is def get background, and it's going to take these background sequence, n equals none, counts equals none. So here, uh, again, this is like the online stats. It's going to constantly give us more information that we're just going to feed back into it the next iteration. So if n is none, so if this is the first time we've used it, n equals zero. Uh, if counts is none, if counts is none, counts equals counter. And now we're going to be for using that count that uh, counter dictionary for the very first time. And here's how we get the background sequence really easy. Counts.update. So here we're saying we're going to push something into this dictionary, this counter dictionary. And all I'm going to push to it is this sequence. 
And then I'm going to say n plus equals. So let's keep a running tally of how long that background sequence is. And then return n counts. So the, the fun magic of this is uh, every time that you give it this background sequence, it's automatically going to calculate for you the number of A's, the number of C's, the number of B's, G's for you, uh, and then keeps track of the total number so that when we need to do PFM stuff, figure out frequency rates, once we've exhausted everything, we can actually come back to it and uh, uh, divide things by the total. Okay, so going back to our init gibs. So now here we're saying is, after we've gone through all the sequences and we've randomly selected some random subsequence, now we can start playing around with the background stuff. Again, you don't need to deal with this background if you don't ha if you don't want to. It's just a fun problem to deal with or to work with. Uh, I'm going to create a pandas series with all the default values to zero. This is akin to making a numpy dot zero. And I'm going to say index equals count dot keys. So if you remember, um, sorry. Um, the idea here is we want to create the number of rows in this background in the series to be the uh, each of the letters of the alphabet uh, that we found in our background sequence, the number of A's, the number of C's, P's. Um, and then the D type equals MP dot float. Just because since this is going to be a background frequency rate, we want we know that's going to be floating number. Excuse me, it's going to be floating point. So for base and base count in enumerate sorted counts dot items. The idea here is counts, remember counts is a dictionary where each P is the base and the value is the number of times that base was seen. Uh, we're iterating through this, and I sorted it so that it comes out in alphabetical order, order uh, for later on. And we just say background uh, for that specific base. So we're looking at like the, the A column or whatever. A row is equal to the base count, what, however many times we saw that base count, divided by the total number of bases we saw. N. And this is why we kept Okay, now we've all done with the background stuff. Return motifs and back. So that's the init Gibbs. And the init Gibbs is, again, we're just initializing that first random matrix at the very beginning. Okay. Uh, now that we have our uh, background initiate, or not our background, the the motif finder initialized, our Gibbs matrix initialized, we're going to play around with some other stuff. So here we're going to see some of those other signature items that I added to our function. If compute background. So if the user says compute background, we're saying whether or not they actually want to use a computed background frequency uh, based off of whatever sequence is there. If they want to use that, it'll compute that from the, we've already computed it through the init background. Um, or through init Gibbs, we already have the init background, so we're going to say background equals init background. So here's the uh, computed uh, background frequencies. Now we're saying L if uh, background is none. So this is if the user doesn't want to use it at all, and they just want to assume uniformity, uh, like Alan does, background equals 0 0.5. And then lastly, uh, if the user supplies something else to sell, so background equals background, whatever the user supplies. Okay, so now we're going to be jumping in. If we look back at the solutions, th we've skipped this part. This is all uh, cordoned, cordoned off 
to the uh, the init Gibbs file. Now we're going to be dealing with this part, the start iteration. And this is the biggest meat to the Gibbs motif finder. So the first part is we need to keep track of our uh, information content, see if there's converge. And this is going to mirror a lot of what you already saw in code. So uh, uh, convergence. And all we're going to say is just like Alan's code, last. I see. Okay. Now we start dealing with the epics. So I'm going to say for i in range. Now, in the previous iteration, we saw that uh, the code that Alan did just said for range in 10,000. We're going to say epics plus one. Because again, when we're testing for convergence with respect to the way Alan did this, he's looking at that. At that specific epic, if it's modulo 100, if it's divisible by 100, check to see if convergence occurs. Um, so if we say 10,000, it'll actually never ac actually check the final 10,000th epic. So if we say plus one, it'll include that final step into the checking. So I just say epic plus one. Um, now we're saying if I, or whatever epic, if i modulo 100 is divisible by 100. Now, this 100 isn't sacred. You can change that 100 to whatever you want. That's perfectly fine. But if it is divisible by 100, uh, we want to start checking for our convergence. So I'll say my convergence CPM equals sl.cpm. Now, here we're leveraging some of Seek Logo. Because remember, Seek Logo does a lot of this for us. We provide a PFM and we push it into a complete PM. It'll automatically compute the uh, position weight matrix and information content for us and we have to deal with that ourselves. So here we're just leveraging. And since we're only doing this every 100 epics, we can actually just directly go through Seek Logo because uh, it's not going to be really that big of a computational issue. So we're going to say uh, this CPM. Now the CPM needs a PFM. The entry is going to be the PFM. Well, we already have a function that makes the PFM, and that's called build PFM. And all build PFM needs, if we look at this, all build PFM needs is the motifs that we'll be using, the alphabet type, alphabet, and again, a lot of this is default. Remember, we're just passing on, because this is the entry point. If the user doesn't define this, it doesn't matter. Uh, it'll just use these basic values and just keep passing them on. So these are like a type one time, but help you down the road kind of. And then the last part is the uh, the background. Now this is if the user, whatever the user intended to use here, either the computed one, the uh, the uniform one, or some predefined. One. So we're just going to background. So now that once that's done, it should have created a, a CPM for us. So we need to check what our current uh, information content is. And we just do that by summing up everything inside the conversion, uh, the convergent CPM.ic. Because remember, Seek Logo has the attribute of information content. And now we're just summing up all of those positions along the here to create a cumulative. Uh, information content for those specific key sequences. So uh, just to give some feedback in here, I'm going to say print in an F string, a format string, current IC score at whatever epic we're on. Epics. And then I'm going to say for so now every time we reach a new epic and it computes this, it's going to pop this out. And this is not so much to help the com computation. It's actually just to give the user some feedback. It's a UI design so that they know something's actually happened. Um, nothing special. Now we're going to say if i equals equals zero. And this is only because if we try to compare a NumPy array to none, we're going to get like a comparison issue. So we're just going to say last IC equals 
currency. Because again, it has nothing to compare against, so it's just going to deal with it the very first time. In all other cases, though, we're going to mess around with some stuff. So uh, Allen's convergence is dependent on if the epic that it saw 100 items ago, or the 100, 100 epic ago, matches the exactly the same epic dealing with now, uh, that determines that convergence is happening. Uh, because of the randomness of this, that is very unlikely to happen. Very unlikely. Uh, I'm not saying it can't, I'm just saying it's very unlikely and maybe not helpful to the user, at least at an educational standpoint. So we're going to use something in NumPy called mp.close, or mp.isclose. And what this allows us to do is compare one thing against another, and if they're close within a specific tolerance, it'll say this is true. And if it's true, it'll say convergence has occurred. So we're going to say if cur IC uh, versus last IC, and now we're going to say this R tolerance, this is the relative tolerance, equal to this. And this is that tolerance that we set up here in our function signature. How close can these two numbers be for it to determine whether or not they're close enough for the user? So here I'm saying I negative 5. Uh, you could set it whatever you want it to set it 1, and it's fine, uh, whatever the tolerance. Now we're saying if this uh, convergent, if conver convergence has occurred, if these two numbers are close to each other, now we're going to say print, just to give some feedback to the user, convergence, convergence detected, and plus or minus some tolerance, okay? And now we're going to give that back. Return that uh, convergent CPM. Remember that there's something special about the convergent CPM in that it's built off of the motifs. These include all of the modified motifs we deal with in the way, not these random sequences that we see at the end. Because if we look here, these motifs, as we iterate one at a time, it's going to pull out, it's going to change one motif at a time each iteration. Well, we want to compute all the motifs as a whole, not leaving one out, which we see in a second. So we want to return just that. Now, in uh, all other cases, here we're saying uh, if this is close, if it's not close, we just need to continue. And that's just last. Last I see equals currency. And then it'll just move on. Okay, so now that's done dealing with the convergence issues. Convergence isn't going to be a huge issue. If you even if you look at Alan's example and you run Alan's example point for point, point for point, over and over and over again, convergence is never detected. Ever. So uh it's not a huge pain point right now. We're not going to deal with it. Uh, I just want you guys to see the backbone. Now let's play around and get into the, some of the fun. So the first thing is I'm going to uh, create a, uh, a, temporary, um, a temporary copy of what we've been dealing with, uh, specifically the sequences, uh, so that I don't accidentally overwrite the ground truth. The, the, the sequences haven't changed. The motifs haven't changed. I don't want to modify those. I just want to constantly come back to those like they're like stock, like feedstock in chem lab. I don't accidentally want to pull some. So I'm going to say mod seeks equals uh, sequences. And by doing this brackets colon, it allows me to copy the list. And the same thing is going to be to the mod motifs is equal to motifs. And I'm just copying. Now, the point of this copying is, again, I don't want to mess up the original motifs. Because, again, I'm going to change, I'm going to modify motifs later on uh, in the iterations. So I'm just creating temporary copies. Now, let's remove and hold out one random sequence. Now, Alan's way of doing this was a little interesting. And, uh, uh, a little difficult to understand. 
uh, if you don't really know what's going on with the random library. So first, let's just say I want to create a random index. And this is saying out of that sequence list, that giant, giant table of sequences, pick a random sequence or pick a random position that I want to be dealing with. And to do that, all I want to do is select my random index. So I'm going to say random dot rand range. And it can pick anything from zero to the length of sequences. And what's cool about rand range is rand range is inclusive. I don't have to do that plus one or anything like that. And it'll pick anything from zero to the very end of the length of sequences. Um, so we'll pick up that one random index. Actually, I may be wrong on the rand range. It'll, because the length of it, yeah, it's, it's inclusive, exclusive, tap open. Um, it'll still be able to give us a random index out of that motif. So now that we have that random index, let's say random seek equals mod seeks, because I'm dealing with my, my copy, my temporary copy, and we're going to use this thing called pop. And pop allows us to remove a specific index out of a list, and it pulls it out of that list, and it actually changes that list such that when we remove it, that list closes down and whatever, the, whatever was in that spot gets deleted from that list. And what pop gives back is what that, uh, rant, whatever item was removed. So here it allows us to pull out everything without having to uh, take everything before and everything after. There's a really cool function for doing that called pop. Okay, the next part is we don't want that because that sequence is tied to the it's a sister motif or, or, or brother motif in the motifs list. So we need to remove that out of the motifs list, our temporary motif list, so that it doesn't uh, uh, intrinsically cause any issues in our random calculations. So I'm just going to throw it away. And that's what this underscore is. It's just like a throwaway variable saying, whatever's here, just put it in this thing and just I don't care about it anymore. So mod motifs, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take pop, and I'm going to remove this random index. Because remember, the, the sequence list is the same length as the mods, the motifs list, and each sequence is tied inextricably to its specific motif. So if we remove sequence n, we have to remove motif n. So now that we've thrown away that selected motif, I'm just going to copy some notes. Now that we've cop, uh, removed that uh, motif, now we get into dealing with the functions that we've already written. So now let's do this. So create our PFM equals build PFM. And we're going to build it from the motifs. Okay. I'm going to give it that alphabet uh, type and the alphabet. because those are part of the function signature. And then from that, we're going to build our PWM. We're just going to pass it that PFM that we just created. Our new pseudo count equals pseudo count. Pseudo count equals pseudo count and background. Background. Okay, so now we've used those functions we've already written. I'm going to take a quick second. Do you guys have any questions up till now? I've been kind of talking full on. Anybody still there? All of it. Did I put you guys to sleep? Okay, I'm not seeing anything in chat, so I guess I'll just keep powering through. 
hopefully somebody's there. It's okay if you guys give me a little bit of encouragement from time to time. I don't... Okay. Thank you, Angel. Okay, so the first part of the Gibbs is saying, pick a random sequence, pull that sequence out, remove that from the motifs, and now we want to calculate from the, that new modified motif, what is the PWM? What is the likelihood given the sequences that we're dealing with right now? Now we have to do uh, the stuff that actually deals with the sequence that we pulled out. Uh, so that sequence that we pulled out, remember that sequence is called Rand C, right? We already pulled that out. We haven't done anything with it, but now we are. So um, I'm going to write these down. And it's just going to be a function signature, and then we're going to move up to a function signature uh, or defining a new function. Uh, and I'll explain things in a second, but just let me do the typing real quick. Strand new equal option. Seek a PWN alphabet type. Okay, so this prob selection is the uh, probabilistic selection of up using the updated motif index. Fancy way of saying we're just going to look and based off of what we've seen, we're going to select new things. So I'm going to move up here and I'm going to add another cell. And we're actually going to be doing this uh, prob selection function. Now, this prob selection function is actually two different functions nested uh, because I like making complicated. So uh, def prob selection and sequence k pwm alphabet I and again this is just to pass things on later on for C logo not terribly important. So uh, the very first part of this is we have to figure out the scores. And uh, Alan does, if you look in this version, what Alan does here is that he starts the scores and then he starts the strand. And then he goes through each position along that random sequence. So it says, starting at position zero for the length of K, find out what its score K or score is, and then move one and then move one, so like a sliding window as it moves across that entire page. Um, and then scores it, and then based off that score, just score and score. Oh, sorry. He has score and here, which does score came. No big deal. Um, Yeah. Anyways, uh, so he def goes back to score and handles. I I'm going to be doing, it. but it essentially the same thing. And then uh, from this score enmer, score enmer, it slides through one at a time, and then it goes through uh, the reverse complement as well. So it finds all the scores one way, and then it turns around and goes back the other way and finds all those scores as well. Uh, that can be very painful in that you're dealing with a list that's twice as long. Uh, and he actually highlights this later on. Uh, when you're dealing with this this list that's twice as long, you have to uh, convert things and all this other stuff. I don't I don't want to deal with. It. So I actually do it a little different. So here I need to create the scores. And this is the first little subsection of this. I'm just going to say scores equals gen scores. And all I'm going to give it is the sequence. A and W. Now I'm going to put a quick hiatus on that function and create this gen scores. Def scores. Sequence A. Okay. Gen scores. Pretty much the same thing he has here, but I use a little di bit different of a uh, a little bit different of a a 
little bit different of a data structure. Trailed off. So it, it works the same way. I'm going to say scores equals zero or equals an empty list, but you'll see that I don't actually make a strands list. And that's because I can just utilize the power of tuples to overcome this. So for pause, base, and numerate sequence. So we're going to be doing the same thing, but we're going to say rand seeker, seeker gamer, equals sequence from whatever the position is that we're currently looking at to position plus k now a drawback to this is is if we did this just naively what happens is sooner or later our index will get to the tail end of the sequence and then the kmer won't be long enough it'll be like a tumor threemer something like that. so we just do a quick check to make sure if len Rand C Kamer is not not equal to K break. So here we're saying is if it isn't a full length Kamer, then I don't care anymore. We're done. Just break, turn the score. Now we start dealing with the scores. So score pause score position equals uh, score. Hammer, Rand C, PWM, alphabet type. So now we've scored that position for one direction, positive direction, positive strength. So scores dot pend, and now I'm just going to create a list. And it's just going to say pause, zero, or positive strand, score, pause. So here we're saying at this index, positive strand had this score. Um, now we're going to do score neg. And uh, it's the same thing, except we're just going to do top. So now we have score neg, and we'll just do scores dot append, but instead of, we're going to look the same pause, but instead of zero, we're going to have uh, score uh, one for the negative string, negative, string. and then just return scores. Okay, so let's jump back into the prob uh, probabilistic selection. Now that we have our scores. Now we have to play with the score. Um, so the first part is to convert the scores into probabilities. Because we're dealing with PWM stuff, we need to turn it into probabilities because when we do probabilistic selection, it needs to be probabilities, not PW, not uh, log likelihoods. So scores equals PD dot data frame. I like playing with pandas when I can. So uh, Pandas has a very super helpful way of doing this. That makes things a little bit more straight. And uh, I'm using the scores. And then the columns, I'm going to predefine that these columns are going to equal uh, position, position, strand, and score. Now these reflect what we had up here. Position, strand, and score. So all I'm doing is just creating a properly formatted data. Now I'm going to say scores.pause equals scores.pause.as type np.int64. Just making sure that instead, because you can't index using floats, I'm turning everything into integers here. And the same thing with scores. U in 64 um, because it's just going to be a 0 or 1, so it doesn't, or not 64. It just can be 0 or 1, so it doesn't. 
Um, now let's do this exponent. Now, if you look at Alan's uh, version of this, um, Alan's version of it is he recomputed uh, score over and over again. I, I don't do that here. Score equals mp.2 scores.score. So I'm just raised everything out of the log two space, uh, moved it into uh, on log two. Uh, scores norm, I'm normalizing those scores by the exp score divided by mp.sum. mp.sum exp score. So this turns everything into probabilities. And now we use the fun part of pandas, which allows us to sample uh, from. So I'm going to say index strand equals scores. Now we're going to randomly sample from the scores. So remember, the scores is each row is a specific uh, is a specific motif score. And the first column is the position. The second column is the strand and the third column is the score. I don't really care about the score anymore. It doesn't matter to me. Anymore. I just care about the in, uh, the position and the strand. So I random I want to randomly sample from that data frame, but I need to base it off of the weights that are the probabilistic weights that just computed the scores norm. So we can say n equals one because I only want a single item from the list. And I say weights equals scores norm. Now those norm, those norms, uh, scores that I just created uh, allow us to properly weight the ability for us to randomly sample specific items in that list. And uh, because all I want to give back, there's going to be some uh, pandas mojo going on here. All I want back are just the first two, uh, first two columns. So. Uh, since I'm only getting one item back, there's only going to be one row. That's the zeroth row. And then I want the first two columns, and that's going to be position strand. And I want those as type because for some reason, pandas uh, tries to change those from integers, even though they're already integers, into floats. I don't know why. Um, and then I'm going to say to list. And what this does is it'll take that sample. It pulls out just one sample, and from here it'll give us one specific index or position and one specific score, or not score, strand, and then it converts it into a list. But if you ever remember, we can always do tuple unpacking. So if it's a two-item list, I can unpack them into two things called index and strand. So that index with the position goes to in, uh, index, and then the strand goes to strand. So I've unpacked them into specific things. And now I can just turn index and strand. So now we did the probabilistic selection of which which came or which motif. So now this function's done. So let's go back to our Gibbs motif. So now that we have a brand new index and a brand new strand that we're going to be pulling from, the, the probabilistically selected strand and index, we need to up. So the way to do this is we say new motif equals brand seek. Because remember, we this is the sequence that we pulled out. We're pulling out a probabilistically selected kmer from that random sequence, adding it, like overriding that motif that was already in the previous list. So we're going to say, index new to index new plus a now we now because there's two sides to this it's both a uh, we have the random camer but we need the whether or not it's going to be a positive or negative brand well we already figured that out with the probabilistic selection new so i can say if not strand new Right? So if it's zero, 
meaning positive strand, motifs. And now I want to overwrite the previous motif that this sequence was associated with, with this new motif. So I'm going to say uh, that rand index, because remember, this hasn't changed. This is the same rand index that was up uh, right here. This is the same rand index that, that, that's not changed. So I still have a good uh, identity or a good address or reference to where, where the sequence lives in original. So I'm going to overwrite that rand index uh, with the, this new motif. Otherwise, so if it's a negative strand, I'm going to say motifs rand index equals cast it reverse complement. Okay, so uh, here everything is rock solid as far as this is concerned. We're good to go. The last part is just what happens, because we haven't controlled what happens when we reach the end of the epics, when we've reached 10,000, if convergence hasn't happened. So we need to give a final report. So here we're saying, I'm out of my for loop, out of my epics. I've done all 10,000 epics. Well, technically 10,000, that's fine. I've done all 10,000 epics. Um, now I'm at the very end, so I'm going to say else, because I like the graceful exit from a for loop. Let's do some cleanup or some reporting. Uh, exited after I epics. Um, no or Tolerance, and then I'm just going to report the tolerance because the user may want to go back and change. Um, now let's do, now we've reached the very end, so we need to find out what the final tally, is, what's the final result of all of our motifs. So final CPM equals SL.CPM. And we're just going to do this little trick that we did up here, the same trick we're going to do. Uh, down here. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to be copying and pasting. So here I'm creating this PFM and I'm saying build PFM. And this is the same thing we did above. But because this is a fully formed CPM, this is a fully formed CPM, I need to add some extra arguments. Again, this for the seek logo stuff. Um, make sure it has the alphabet type, the alphabet pseudo count, the background all maintained with seek. So now that I have that, I'm going to do one final print f final ic score dot com. And then return that final CPM. Oh, okay. All right. I'm just doing a quick check over some of my notes over my side. I'm going to copy and hasn't changed. Use it in my I just want to make sure something. Okay. I knew I was gonna do this. Okay, so score camer is actually one of the biggest bottlenecks in this program because we do it so many times. It's not just like every sequence, but then every camer within that sequence, we have to score each and every time. So we have to have score camer be as efficient as possible. So 
uh, I'm going to actually do a pretty significant rewrite to, or I shouldn't say, I'm going to be rewriting Score Kamer to be a little bit more efficient than the one you guys have. Alphabet. And after I'm done with this, we're actually should be done. So this will look pretty similar to what we're going to be doing, what is already there. So if len seek not equal to pwm.shape zero. So if the length of the sequence isn't the length of the pwm rows, um, raise value error. Okay, now we're going to iterate through them. I'm going to be using my fun enumerate. 4j base i base in a new uh, seek sequences for plus equals pwm and remember this is a special pwm in that it's not the columns are the bases not the rows so i'm going to say what row am i on the i and then we're going to go back to using that base to index function that we wrote before. And once it's gone through and summed all those up, Okay, so now that that's all said and done, we should have everything that we need. So if we run this, if you guys remember, I actually had those. Okay, so now that I have those sequences, now let's actually run those and see what happens. So Gibbs motif finder, and I'm gonna give it those seeks that I just wrote. And what's our K gonna be? 10 and epics. Let's start off easy and say 100. Okay, I have an error. The fun of life. Sure. All it, a lot of this is just me adding. Okay, so here it's saying, because if you look at this, there's essentially two epics that are reached. The first is when epic is zero, the very first time, and that's where it gives us epic zero, and then this is what our random selection, the first initialization is. And then after 100 epics, that score is changed here.
going so slow and fast. So let me just up everything. Did a lot of And then I'm just adding in a lot of annotations because, again, I'm going to be putting this onto GitHub at some point. So I want to make sure that all my documentation is straight, guys. So I'm just. So what do you guys think about this medium? Are you guys actually liking this uh, office hours? I was hoping that it was going to be a little bit more interactive, but it seems like it's kind of... You guys are watching me or paying attention to other stuff, or maybe because you know that it's going to be recorded. You don't care as much. Saying that that's a bad thing, saying that that's something somebody can do. Um, are you guys liking this? Is this something that you would want to do in the future? in your comments get yeah there is a delay in the chat and that's because there's a lot of encoding going on that goes to you guys and then once you guys finally are able to see it then you respond and maybe some 30 seconds have elapsed i would never i would i i don't know um as far as Will this video be uploaded? Uh, if you come to the this same Twitch channel, I've set it to store my sessions, and it'll store them for 14 days. One, four, 14 days. And uh, after that, they'll be deleted unless I download them myself. So you have 14 days to come back and read it. It's, it's fine. Um, I'm glad that it's helped you guys. Uh, I'm really interested in doing this. I think I think it's fun. I definitely went over. I was expecting it just to be one hour. I ended up to be two hours. Uh, but after running all those, let's see. Run from the top. Set on a bit. And. See what happens. Okay, so. While that's doing its thing, uh, can you guys give me some details on things that you wouldn't mind changing, or did you like the audio? Did you like the video? Were things helpful? Uh, that sort of stuff. I tried really hard to work on the audio, so I'm hoping that it comes out pretty clear. Can you guys understand me? All right. And for the heck of it, I'm going to go through our Gibbs Motif Finder and go the full 10,000. And you'll see that even this way, uh, it'll print out these things as it sees them, as it gets to those epics. Uh, that even after 10,000, it still doesn't reach convergence, depending on whatever you set it up. Yeah, so uh, to talk about this, this is actually, I'm like a major... Uh, webcam guy, like I hate webcams. I hate people seeing me. I'm very much against people taking my picture. I even have, like, I've disabled my webcam on my computer through the BIOS and on the motherboard. Um, but I bought a kind of fancy webcam to use here to get a little bit better of a picture. And then the microphone is uh, my Christmas present my wife gave me because I've been really interested in doing 
uh, online classes for programming, uh, teaching Python, and you have to do auditions and stuff like that. And I wanted a really good audio because I hate I hate it when you just get on compute on the on Twitch or whatever, and somebody's just like has their uh, basic webcam on their computer and they're like speaking in their their microphone headphones that are like down here and they're like not even holding it and maybe they're crunched over or something like that. Just it's a really bad experience. So I'm trying to make it as positive as possible. Um, and I've tried hard as far as like OBS is concerned or as far as the uh, setup. So if I go to my intermission chat, uh, let's see, go over. So now we're in intermission chat and you get to see like my background stuff. Um, Yeah, that's actually an intention of mine is to uh, do some more lower level, talking about more advanced level or advanced Python, uh, or getting people that are like intermediate to, uh, or sorry, beginner to intermediate uh, Python programmers and getting them to deal with more advanced concepts of Python. And, you know, the basic stuff you're not really taught. And if you're not a computer science guy, uh, if you're not a computer science guy, if you're not a computer science person, or if you haven't been programming your whole life, there's a lot of things that people take uh, advantage of or take for granted. Specifically, in our class, we talk. Alan's a computer scientist by nature; that's where his training is in. So there's a lot of aspects of it that are very simple concepts for him that are actually uh, difficult for beginners because you guys may be biologists, but you, you're not statisticians, you're not uh, programmers. So you're having to learn a lot of stuff all at once that uh, because of the curse of knowledge, he's forgotten what it's like to not know that. So not only are you learning about what is a motif, but you're also learning the programming behind finding those it can be very difficult sometimes uh and i don't envy you guys and that's part of the reason that i tried to set up this uh stream this virtual is to so you guys can see the way that i do things uh in program. i think my computer is going so slow now because i'm streaming as well and like my cpu is just like hurt it's like it's been like 90% the entire time I've been here. Because earlier today, this right here, this Gibbs motif finder, that thing, that thing just like went so quickly uh, earlier. And I've been really trying to prototype it to make it. Okay. That's going to take a while. I assure you that it will not meet, it'll not get to convergence. It'll just report the PWM. Uh, but we can easily say uh, when it gets to it, we're going to say C, whatever that is, uh, C, C, S, L, and I'm going to create a C logo from that C when it matches. But, uh, did you guys think that the material, the actual code and the process in which I wrote it made sense? Did you guys like that? Or was I introducing complicated stuff? Yeah, exactly, Angel. That's it's definitely a big undertaking, and especially when you have uh co-teachers, co-instructors, where they may think they're on the same wavelength. They may think that they're talking about the same concept, but they're tackling it in two different ways. And while the one on the Gibbs lecture was a very super helpful, uh, was a very super helpful PowerPoint, it was actually kind of complicated in that 
there was a lot of stuff that unless you know the uh unless you know the content that you're working on unless you know the concepts that you're playing with uh there's a lot of stuff that was left out in the powerpoint slides when do you omit things when do you uh bring them back when do you add them uh and then for Alan and Ryan, I'm not dogging them. They're terrific instructors. They're, or I should, they're terrific uh, in the field. They forgot that some of the stuff they know, uh, we don't even know yet. So some of the the stuff they've forgotten, they've forgotten more about the field than we know at this point. So they take it for granted in that case, and. Honestly, another point you brought up, Angel, is that it's really hard to take a concept like Gibbs sampling and apply it to uh, programming. It's it's very difficult, especially when you're learning to program. So uh, you guys are in a very difficult position, and I've been trying to talk to the instructors about uh, uh, allowing us to teach anything or to teach stuff in a different way that is actually takes the pressure off of you guys trying to figure out how to program and more focuses on you guys trying to understand the concepts that we're trying to teach. Yeah. Um, as far as stuff to learn ahead of time, Alan's doing a good job of trying to go ahead and say, Hey, look up this information and, um, uh, read up on this stuff. But, I, I think he's afraid of pointing you guys to anything too specific because he wants you guys uh, working on it in class, uh, not just going ahead of time. So we, I had to convince him, I had to convince them to uh, start giving out those notebooks ahead of time, so you guys have a little bit more time to uh, process the information. As far as stuff to read up on, it, I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, probably not a wealth of information there. Uh, I haven't done a whole lot of, I'm doing a lot of the Canvas administration stuff. I'm not really actually implementing a lot of the code myself. Like, I didn't even play with this Gib sam sampling stuff until, like, this weekend. Or not, should, since classes. So, so this is, like, my attempt. And, uh, wow. I'm sorry, Angel. I don't really have anywhere you point me to. Uh, if you look ahead and you feel confused about something, I can try to help you. The problem is, is my way of doing things in Python aren't always the same way uh, Alan would do it. So I would say, oh, that yeah, this makes sense. Uh, I'm just going to use this. I'm going to use pop or I'm going to use random or I'm going to use something else like that. It's not always the first thing Alan will jump to. So I may potentially accidentally point you in the wrong direction so that when it comes to class, you're not doing it the way that he's expecting. I wish that was a little bit more help. Yeah, my CPU, like, <laughs> this was done in like a minute earlier today. Killing. Uh, so, in that, I'm just going to call it a night unless you guys have anything else to talk about and i hope this was helpful so good night <laughs>